Well, hello, everybody. I want to welcome everyone to the SPIA Alumni Speaker Series. Today's topic considers environmental policy issues and solutions, and I've got two great panelists for you. Uh, I want to thank, though, everybody for joining us and also thank our sponsors, Verizon and Georgia Power. Uh, the sponsorship that they provide for this goes to some of our key uh, priorities, including um, need-based undergraduate study abroad scholarships and internships, uh, internship stipends for MPA students. Uh, these are priorities that uh, I work on with our uh, SPIA alumni board, and I want to thank them for helping us identify sponsors for today's meeting and for uh, helping us uh, bring together great speakers for the series. Um, I want to also just quickly mention a couple um, upcoming events. Uh, please be on the lookout for the 2022 Suzette Tallarico Lecture, uh, which will be presented virtually on March 31st. Our speaker will be Valerie Hans. She's Charles Recklin Professor of Law at Cornell Law School. And also be on the lookout for communications about our next my speaker series event, which will take place in May. That's going to be in person, uh, but also available virtually. Uh, we'll be at the Metro Atlanta Chamber. We're looking forward to that. But without further ado, let me introduce you to today's speakers, both of whom are alumni uh, of our program. Margaret Reams is the Joseph D. Martinez Professor of Environmental Sciences at Louisiana State University, where she focuses her research on environmental policy and management, resilience, and sustainability. Professor Reams also serves as a community engagement core leader at the LSU Superfund Research Program. She earned her master's and doc doctoral degrees in political science from SPIA. Amy Fletcher is an adjunct senior fellow at the University of Canterbury who specializes in science, technology, and environmental politics. Prior to assume, assuming her role in New Zealand in 2000, she worked as a legislative assistant in the US House of Representatives on telecommunication and technology issues. Dr. Fletcher also earned her master's and doctorate degrees in political science from SPIA. I want to uh, ask you to thank, uh, ask you to join me in, in welcoming our, our two panelists. And also wanted to mention that um, I have a few questions that I'll start out with, but uh, please use the Q&A uh, function. Uh, put your questions for our panelists into Q&A. The chat is disabled. But with that, I think I'll start in and maybe pose a few questions. I'll start with both uh, Professor Reams and, and uh, Professor Fletcher. So um, this is such a broad area. Mm -hmm. Issues, environmental concerns, you've been working on uh, in these arenas for many years. When you think about the University of Georgia, um, there's so many different units on our campus and so many co colleges and schools that uh, have a piece of this action including the School of Public and International Affairs at multiple departments. But, you know, I'm interested in, in, in your particular professional vantage point um, on this incredibly broad area. Maybe you could each of you provide a, a brief sketch of your pathway uh, from your degree uh, or the MBA to where you are today. Uh, Professor Reams, why don't we start with you? Okay, thanks, Matt. I know we had talked about this earlier back a few months ago when we first made contact and students often ask, you know, what a political scientist is doing in an environmental sciences department at a research university like LSU. And it's uh, simply, I think there's been a sea change, you know, when it comes to uh, the kinds of research uh, questions and the research teams and the kinds of expertise that are needed when we start thinking about complex second and third generation environmental problems, you know, like, um, um, you know, climate change certainly, but, but, you know, more interactive kinds of environmental problems that are thorny and difficult to uh, really address. So the short answer is, is that I um, was uh, uh, starting at, L at LSU to teach environmental policy and planning. Um, in a multidisciplinary department of environmental studies that over the years has grown and uh, added a PhD program now. And, uh, but again, there's room for social scientists, physical scientists, and life scientists in my academic department. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fletcher. Uh, 
Hi, I'm very glad to be here and I would concur with that. When I graduated from Georgia in the late 1990s, there was the beginning of the talk about multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary work. And while I think in the next two decades we've made some progress, I still see a lot of silos. And I've noticed that well, many, there are many of my colleagues who are in the hard sciences who are now very much interested in bringing in the arts and the social sciences. There is still a lingering reluctance among certain scientists to sort of see the social sciences as being legitimate. So I think we still have a lot of work in that area. I'm optimistic and I think it's changing, but I think some people might be surprised at how rigid those silos can still be. So again, um, agreeing with Margaret, I think that the social sciences bring one, a human element, but it's a human element based in social scientific methods. And I think that's a very important thing to emphasize. I also think my work is in the area of de-extinction and that crosses into a bunch of different areas. And just as a quick example, when the de-extinction idea first hit the mainstream, a lot of very talented, optimistic molecular biologists started talking about bringing back the woolly mammoth. Now, as a technical idea, that fascinates me. Well, the very first thing that happened is the IUCN had to point out that if you do, let's say that you do that, it's immediately an endangered species. And the regulations and the legislation and all of the social scientific policy legislative issues, plus the legal ones, plus the economic ones like patenting something like a woolly mammoth, you know, all of that just immediately starts rushing out. And I think scientists are sometimes surprised by this. So I do, I believe that the disciplines are starting to talk more, but I still think there's more resistance than there should be. And I also think the social scientists just have to keep making the argument that we have a place in this and we bring something to the table that is grounded in methods and grounded in expertise. Thank you so much for sharing both of your respective vantage points on this and how you got to where you are. So I want to now go right into thinking about environmental issues and environmental trends. Um, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on as you sort of you know, think about the, the environmental issues or con concerns that give you the most pause, that are the most concerning to you, what are they? And then uh, considering that you're steeped in this every day, I'm interested in whether there's certain kinds of environmental risks that you think about, but that we may not tend to think about. So if you sort of look into the future, peer over the horizon, what sorts of things are we maybe not paying attention to that we should pay attention to that, that are kind of on your radar? Okay, and Matt, would you like me to take that first? <laughs> sure. I, I think one of the, the things that is the biggest threat, at least over um, in my part of the world here in this near this industrial corridor in Louisiana, but the area between Baton Rouge and New Orleans that's home to so many environmental justice communities. I think that it's it's sort of a social science problem that is is killing us when it comes to environmental planning, and that is the um, environmental justice communities and not accessing sort of the paths of um, influence into local government decisions and uh, really regulatory decisions in general. And I think that that you know, as we're seeing, um, and, and in a way, again, that's a political and social kind of problem that has implications for uh, the future of the environmental quality, uh, especially in heavily industrialized area. But I think better access, if we think of it to the levers of democracy among residents of environmental justice communities um, is something that is a real pressing problem. And I think that uh, new thinking needs to occur and that we need to better understand the conditions under which um, really collective action is, is more likely to occur among these uh, that have been, you know, really just used as dumping grounds. And I think that the, there's been a lot of complacency and fatalism among residents of that type of community, and it has set the stage for this kind of piling on of cumulative environmental hazards, you know, just being packed into 
to these communities that have been politically powerless. So I think that there is, is going to be, um, you know, eventually uh, economic and social unrest, you know, coming out of uh, some of these areas that have just really been, you know, used as dumping grounds. So I think that anything that we can do, especially as political scientists, to bring better access, you know, to the paths of government decision making and citizen input uh, from these voiceless uh, communities. I think I think we need to have done this yesterday because it, again, it's creating economic um, hardship that is is going to to really hurt even even affluent states. Um, you know, we're, we're only going to be as strong as these these weakest communities. So anyway, I I think that, that there's definitely a, a political access type of issue that overlaps with environmental urgency. I would definitely endorse that. And I also, obviously, climate change. And that is the umbrella issue within which everything is happening. So that creates its own set of very complicated geopolitical dynamics. Within that, with that as sort of the umbrella issue, I think, again, if you come back to de-extinction, there's a lot of decent plausible, strong ethical arguments against doing it. But one of the strongest arguments for trying to de-extinct certain species is that climate change is related to the biodiversity crisis. And every species that you lose takes genetic health and genetic information out of the global genome, if you will. So while I think climate deserves to be front and center, climate is very much related to both the problem of habitat expansion. There's just nowhere for so many species to go. And we really need to think about urban development patterns and what development means and how you create livable cities that also have a space for the rest of the planet in terms of species. And I think this question, again, whether it's agricultural crops becoming ever more monocultural I mean, it also has a real domestic effect. It's not just species out in the wild. We are seriously rapidly depleting the genomic health, if you will, of this planet. And that's a very scary thing once you start to look at it. I guess the other thing I would add that relates to this question of the political dynamics, I know we don't wanna to go too far down this path right now and I'm being agnostic. I'm not trying to come down on one side or the other, but we know that we have a problem of hyperpartisanship and a problem with public belief in or respect for expert knowledge. And you cannot address environmental problems without acknowledging the people that have done the hard yards who know their methods, they know their science, and sometimes they're gonna tell us things we don't wanna hear. So I know that's a ten, it's sort of an adjunct issue, but I think it's really crucial, this decreasing public faith and expertise. And we've seen that play out with COVID. I think we're seeing it play out with a variety of issues. And if it really begins to infect environmental policy, I think we're in a very dangerous space at that point. Right, I would agree. So let's build a little bit on, on this and, and sort of let's think about a, a sort of hypothetical context of it's not hypothetical, uh, but to, to Professor Reeves, to your question or to your thoughts about industrial activity and industrial siting. So it could be a manufacturing facility, or as you mentioned, it could be, for example, the siting of, of waste. Mm -hmm. um, to your point that there have been communities that have been disproportionately affected by that, and they tend to be disempowered. And so there's, there's a question of voice and leverage um, in your in your experience, and, and perhaps also Professor Fletcher thinking about techn technology and other sorts of, of um, ways forward, have you seen examples where um, different interests have created that collective that you mentioned, uh, Professor Reams? You know, is there uh, an illustration where, hey, here is an example where industry was proactive. There was good collaboration, let's say, with environmental non-governmental organizations or local um, uh, pub, uh, public agencies to do some problem solving, and this is what it looked like. Do you are there are there some thoughts that you have about that? Are there some uh, potential illustrations that give you some hope? 
That's a great question because, you know, again, it, it, it it's so uh, awful, you know, many mornings, you know, waking up and, and thinking about the political polarization and, you know, the, these disadvantaged, disadvantaged and disenfranchised communities, frankly. So, I, you know, I think the short answer is, is that there are some um, elements of hope over here in Louisiana, for example, where working uh, to create a, 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 what we're calling a, a new environmental justice community of practice. And this idea of you know, communities of practice, you, you, know, you read about in public health literature, but this idea of NGOs, universities, faith-based communities, local business groups, um, coming together, um, you know, to really, you know, share some practical, well, I guess scientifically um, <laughs> neutral um, research, you know, as to, to, to what can be expected in terms of a, of a changing threat level. So I think one example, though, of uh, something that has been working is um, out in California, I had done some work with um, the U.S. Um, for at local uh, fire reduction programs that were uh, kind of communities of practice around the issue of, of making communities more uh, fire resilient. And they have a, a system called the, the California Fire Safe Council that is, is a, a sort of a franchise style um, framework organization uh, where at the local level, there are chapters uh, that are made up, again, of <clears throat> property owners, but um, you know, also some university researchers are involved. Um, um, banks, you know, step in and, and uh, you know, provide incentives, you know, associated with mortgages and things. Um, but it has, has been, um, you know, a kind of all hands on deck um, uh, attitude. And we've thought about here in Louisiana that that type of uh, uh, hybrid, you know, kind of a franchise system, though, that, that brings together, you know, community stakeholders, as well as, um, you know, private sector uh, businesses and the regulators uh, into some sort of information sharing network um, where best practices, you know, from other localities can be shared. We've, we've thought that that would work well also with coastal um, you know, hazard mitigation planning, because again, that's a, a uh, you know, more of, a, it's, it's not a pollution problem, but it's a, an issue where uh, the short-term economic gains of just doing, you know, land development and business as usual uh, is really at odds, you know, with the community's long-term best interest. Uh, but, but again, um, I think there, there's some, some elements of, of hope um, and, and especially that fire safe council system in California. Um, but again, we need, we need communities of practice around various um, environmental challenges. So just the idea of, of bringing environmental justice residents to the table to help with low land use decisions means that again, uh, we're going to have to help build networks of communication. We're gonna to have to help um, introduce kind of a scientifically sound and holistic view of the changing hazard threat level, whatever that is, whether it's wildfire, uh, land loss at the coastal level, sea level rise, or just this kind of slow moving air pollution that we see in these industrial corridors. We've got to get decent science communicated in, in a way that these networks of stakeholders can use and talk about. And then finally, we have to be able to point to lessons learned from um, you know, analogs and uh, things that could be applied and tested in various local levels across a variety of environmental issue areas. So I think that community of practice model is important. Most of my experience recently would come from New Zealand. So I can give you an example from there. I'm currently very recently a visiting professor here at Eastern Kentucky University, which is in Richmond. And I am noticing, though I'm not nearly expert on it yet, that a lot of Appalachian communities are defying the stereotypes and they're, they're resisting these sort of simplistic, it's either coal, 
yeah. or it's the environment, it's either coal or it's unemployment and chronic poverty. So there is some dynamic things happening, I think, throughout the Appalachian region. What I can speak to more clearly, though I want to be careful to say that I don't in any way speak for the Maori community, but I did observe in New Zealand, I lived in Christchurch, the Canterbury region, and there the question of water is one of the most fraught political questions because New Zealand is a Western developed country, but 12 to 15% of its GDP is still based in agriculture. And cow farming takes a huge toll on the waterways. Now, to be fair, New Zealand farmers, for the most part, are very good faith actors trying to do farming in an environmentally sustainable way, but it still wasn't working and water was becoming ever more politicized, communities were breaking down. And against the backdrop of that, you also have over the last 20 years, what's been called the Maori Renaissance, where indigenous peoples are reclaiming their language, they are reclaiming their traditional knowledge about the environment, which they've held for over a thousand years. So all of that's come together. Again, there's still progress to be made and it hasn't been easy. And the government had to bring in some top-notch facilitators, but they just confronted these in communities. They didn't try to softly, softly the issues. They met with farmers, they met with communities, they met with activists and they met with the indigenous community and they let people work it out in ways that weren't always easy to navigate. But if you look at water policy and water governance, particularly in Christchurch, New Zealand, there are new holistic models that are bringing in indigenous community knowledge and governance mm -hmm. in very innovative ways. And it seems that they are making progress that water policy is working for the whole community farming can coexist with a more environmentally conscious world and you know the net positives are increasing as they go so i think you know for people that are interested in water governance i would look specifically at christchurch new zealand and what it's done over about the last 15 years thank you both well water might come up uh, again in, in thinking about the next question um professor fletcher you had mentioned climate change as a kind of big umbrella issue and then when you unpack climate change, uh, there's so many other issues to think about. I wanna try again to sort of project ahead, let's say uh, 50 years from now, because a, a number of the things that both of you have mentioned here are, are aspects of what I think you could describe as, we need to have communities be more resilient. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so there's a lot of discussion about um, how do we achieve resilience in an age of climate change? Uh, how do we make sure that communities are adapted to what will really likely to be uh, uh, inevitable negative consequences of, of climate change? So I wonder if you can help us, I mean, coming from a technology perspective, coming from um, a collective action kind of perspective, if we were to project ahead 50 years, let's say it's 2072, and we're in, we're in coastal Georgia, take a town like Brunswick, um, and I, I'm thinking about coastal areas in part because of sea level rise, uh, susceptibility to tropical storms um, and, and other uh, issues uh, that, that, that we should be conscious of because of climate change. What does a community like, let's say Brunswick, um, look like if we've been successful at making it resilient uh, some decades from now, project out to 2072? What do we need to do? What will that community look like in order to be resilient in the face of climate change? Well, I'll jump in first. I, I think that the resilience community or the social ecological resilience literature, you know, gives a lot of insights as to attributes of more resilient communities facing a variety of hazards. And, you know, the first thing is that there's a, an ability to self-organize. And this is analogous with natural ecosystems that the constituent members, you know, can um, almost not, if not seamlessly, then, they, but they're, they're very quick on their feet to adapt, to maintain continuing um, certain processes, you know, that are in functions that are key to that unique community. And, you know, whether again, it's a bunch of, you know, uh, wildlife, you know, living in an ecosystem or people, the idea of that social capital 
and the lack of lo maybe lower political politi uh, polarization is, uh, you know, the enemy of resilience, because the idea is that there has to be the trust and, um, you know, the, the people have to just believe that, that you know, that, that it's not a zero sum game when they're investing, you know, in the future or giving up some degree of property rights, um, freedoms, um, you know, for the sake of the long-term survivability of the community. So, so that trust and network building is, is, is a critical component, uh, you know, and as I mentioned a minute ago, the sound holistic view of the changing hazard levels. And if we're indeed in this post-truth kind of moment, uh, you know, that needs to, to be put to bed pretty quickly because, you know, again, there needs to be um, uh, some consensus around how, how significant the threat is if we don't invest now. And then thirdly, you know, that idea of, of being able to apply lessons learned to facilitate adaptations. And um, I think, you know, in the climate um, education field, they talk, they make a distinction between adapting and mitigating. And the adaptations are the things that we have to do to live, you know, with the changing conditions, whereas the mitigations are really reducing the greenhouse gases, which is going to be a longer term, um, uh, you know, necessity. But I think, you know, the, things like a place like Brunswick, you know, would um, probably do well to restore, you know, some of the, uh, let's just call them urban wetlands, but the wetlands that maybe have been developed and um, uh, in, in current day, um, they, New Orleans has done this to, to a small extent, but the communities that flooded sometimes um, or after Katrina, not all of them were rebuilt, obviously, in the same way. And the idea of, of restoring some kind of original hydrology, you know, to the landscape of the community is, I think, going to be important. And the Army Corps of Engineers is talking um, more about investing in soft flood control measures, you know, like restoring original uh, hydrology, but some, some wetlands to retain, you know, the floodwaters. Um, certainly better building practices, you know, so that um, people building new houses and businesses will, you know, very quietly, you know, go along with the idea of uh, slight elevations, maybe uh, tougher building um, codes. Um, you know, the, and, and, but ultimately, I think the, you know, they're going to they're have to have uh, evacuation routes and uh, plans, you know, as to how to relocate locate people maybe for months at a time. Um, you know, there needs to probably be a planned retreat, you know, that will be somewhat orderly into more inland communities that the schools and the highways and the hospitals won't be overwhelmed. Um, and, and ultimately, all that political will um, is going to have to be um, enhanced. And I think through this kind of sharing of the science, and, and that's the role for us, you know, how do we do this? How do we translate, you know, the science and the modeling research to um, show what the future is likely going to be under different scenarios? And how is it that we can communicate that so that it's believable and trustworthy? And again, I think it's tricky, but you know, not, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an imperative. I think one of the things I'm really hoping is that once the immediate crisis does hopefully begin to recede, that we learn our lessons about COVID, because while this is a pandemic issue versus specifically a climate issue, I think there's a lot that's going to overlap when you start talking about climate resilience. Now, in some cases, this is going to be very specific questions. How does this community know when it's time for people to start moving right. from these coastal areas? And I think that's important because, yes, you've got to have an overarching policy framework, but communities are very distinct. So one big challenge is you're going to have your overarching framework, but each community, as Margaret pointed out, are going to have to have really difficult discussions about what resilience looks like in that community. Related to that, and getting back to my point about COVID, it's kind of been established in the scientific literature, the science journalism literature, science communication, and I've seen it myself often. Well-meaning experts who know their stuff often think that if they just keep throwing facts at you, that that's going to change hearts and minds. 
If you don't yet agree with me, I'm just going to ramp up and give you some more data. I'm going to give you some more science. And eventually, you will surely agree that this is scientifically informed policy. And it's a challenge because we do have a whole contingent now that's amplified through social media that just chooses not to believe. But I'm not even talking about them, even within the boundaries of people who aren't seeking to disrupt. I've watched the CDC through COVID and with due respect, they've almost vacillated between take it on faith and then giving us too much insight into the sausage making of science. And I think cutting that balance between giving people reliable information within boundaries of probability is really, really hard to do. And I think we've seen with COVID that the messaging has to be consistent. And if you are going to, I mean, you have to explain to people, something can be said one day, it wasn't that we were lying, it's that the more data's come in and now it looks like this. So to kind of summarize, I think there's two things there. I think science communication is a field that still needs so much development and good people coming into it from the arts, the sciences and the social sciences, because that is difficult with the best of intentions and even a willing audience to convey the complexities of the kind of science you're talking about when it comes to something like climate. And at the risk of maybe going too far a step back, I'm a big advocate of what I call scientific and technological literacy. If you look at the shift from the 19th to the 20th century, mass basic literacy became a key thing. I think, I don't mean everybody has to go into STEM fields and I don't mean every child needs to be encouraged to be a computer scientist. What I mean is that I think being able to have basic conversations about risk and science and probability, I think those are as key, if I may, to citizenship in the 21st century as literacy was to the 20th. And I think that's really where it starts. You can't just start throwing these really dramatic, scary things at people if they have no context and no training in how to adjudicate that kind of information. Uh, this is interesting as we sort of develop uh common threads across some of your responses. I'm struck by um, all the remarks about science, science literacy communication, and how key those are for um, problem solving and for bringing people together to kind of, kind of roll in the same direction. Let's talk about um, uh, a context I think you both know about, certainly Professor Reams, that that's absolutely deals with the issue of risk, and, and that's super fun. So you mentioned fun before, Mm -hmm. Maybe you could just, for our audience, tell us a little bit about Superfund. Um, you know, when you look at um, the sites, Superfund sites, the, there are a fair number that are in the South. <laughs> quite Indeed. a few in, of course, Louisiana. Yeah. And there's yeah. some in Georgia, sure. lots in Texas. Sure. Um, and so I'm interested, again, you know, a number of questions we're thinking about here. Are, okay, they're the problems. And Superfund, wow. I mean, these are big environmental um, complex uh, environmental problems that require, um, among other things, technological uh, solutions. And so, mm -hmm. Fletcher, maybe also you could speak to both of you to, are there examples of places where, hey, cleaning up this super fun site worked? Uh, here's a success story. My guess is at some level, technology played a role in that, but there are probably other variables mm -hmm key as well. And maybe you could compare that to the more intractable issues or ones that, you know, efforts to, to deal with um, a, a super fund issue just hasn't gone as, as smoothly and is right. more sort of intractable and why is that the case? But okay. let's with maybe just quickly a sketch of what is super fun because we have all these super fun sites. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. And it started with the um, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980, and that's better known as CERCLA. And this also had um, uh, within it a trust fund whereby Congress allocated some money to clean up the worst of the worst um, abandoned hazardous waste sites around the country. So this 
um, had to be a, a, a site where there was some sort of, you know, risk to human health and also ecosystem quality. But um, generally, in, in, in by definition, there had to be an absentee responsible party so that, you know, the avenues had been exhausted trying to, you know, good luck trying to find the people that uh, were really at one time legally responsible for this kind of damage. And in the case of these industrial corridors, like in Louisiana and over around Beaumont, Texas, and uh, areas of New Jersey and California, and also Michigan, in those areas, you know, you get these companies kind of, you know, in in business for five, ten years, you know, taking hazardous waste. Uh, and leftover stuff, you know, from some of these industrial facilities that are, you know, petrochemical manufacturing plants. And again, they, the, the waste disposal facilities sometimes change hands. And again, it makes it impossible to track down a responsible party. So that was the idea that there would be, you know, this, this fund that could be used um, to, to take care of some of the worst of the worst. But um, as you can imagine, and, and it's also part of this community right to know uh, component of that act. So built into this process is this elaborate um, and very admirable, you know, flowchart of how it is that the affected community people are supposed to have a seat at the table when it comes time to making decisions about the cleanup technology and the remediation steps that would be taken for a particular site, waste site. And the process is that the site has to be nominated to get on, onto this national priorities list. And there, as you can only imagine, the politics you know, begin there. And in some communities, um, the business interest and, and also some of the political interests don't want the stigma of something being called a Superfund site. In other areas, you know, in some of the poor communities in Louisiana, they've welcomed it. Around Homa, Louisiana, um, the local government was on board. Uh, but the point is that th this is such a diverse set of uh, abandoned hazardous waste sites. You know, you can only imagine, you know, the, in the environmental media being affected varies. Um, you know, sometimes it's groundwater contamination, other times surface, soil, there can even be air um, contamination. So there's no one size fits all in terms of the um, kind of top list of cleanup technologies. And, uh, you know, what, would, what will work in one area will not work in another. And so often there is a sense of just covering the thing up with a clay barrier, which, um, I'm in a conference this week that is exploring some of these remediation techniques. And lo and behold, that can be the safest um, for, you know, compared to some other ideas like scraping the soil and then incinerating it, you know, and maybe introducing um, some of these, um, you know, AAHs and other things into, uh, and PAHs into other um, environmental media. So you can do more harm than good sometimes. But the point is there's no one size fits all cleanup technology. There is never ever enough money to really do it thoroughly and to you know, go in years and years later and continue testing. And again, um, so there's a suspicion that you try to do it on the cheap. Uh, and again, the fact that this is designed to include communities and the choice of cleanup technologies, you, know, you can imagine there's enough scientific uncertainty about the long-term effectiveness of the technology itself and also the cost. So that makes the cost benefit calculations difficult to reach a consensus around um, because it's gonna depend again on, you know, what is the um, long-term plan to use that land? And so the question of how clean is really clean enough, it's, it's a socio-political economic question because at the end of the day, it depends on the future uh, needs of that area and how many people live around it. But the point is that this, there's enough uncertainty and enough lack of money that we see stalemates like this area, um, an, an old Superfund site called Devil's Swamp. You know, what a lovely name. Uh, north of Baton Rouge in an environmental justice community. And uh, the, the neighbors, about 40 of them, want to be bought out. They, they want to be moved. 
but the EPA Dallas region is now actively trying to get this jump started to, to, to remediate the site, but it's, um, it's, it's pretty bad. You know, it's groundwater contamination, surface water, the wildlife around there um, is, is not edible anymore. You know, people's gardens and um, things are, are dangerous. So um, the, the site is, is, they've reached a stalemate and this has happened um, throughout the, the southern, the Dallas region. Uh, with Louisiana, Texas, even New Mexico, some of these sites are just, you know, they, there's a consensus that they're off limits, they're not safe, you know, to do any fishing around them or to hike around them or to get too close to them. But the local stakeholders have not really been satisfied about an ultimate remediation plan. So we see some of these just, you know, kind of walk fenced off with warning signs around them. So it, it's a you know, it's a great goal for the Superfund program. It, there have been some success stories, but this, again, it, there's enough scientific uncertainty, enough uh, lack of money and uh, confusion among stakeholders. And again, a lack of trust in, in what the science is uh, leading us to in the way of a remediation uh, decision. So anyway, it's a fascinating program. Uh, I'm happy to defer to Margaret on super funds, okay. <laughs> but another area that I think is well worth looking at is this question of smart cities. Yeah. And I've done some work on Chattanooga and I believe it was 1969, right around there that Walter Cronkite announced on the nightly news that the EPA had found that Chattanooga was the single most polluted city in the United States. You had incredibly divided city, you had riots, you had the industrial sector was closing, and it just seemed like Chattanooga was on the path to dying as a city. Now, it didn't happen overnight, but beginning in the 70s, and it's a model that now tracks through Chattanooga, they've used very specific facilitation and scenario techniques to get different groups within the community working together. And rather than starting from the top down, which increasingly was not working at all, they've been trying to build capacity from the bottom up. So Chattanooga recently won a key award as an up and coming Southern city that's becoming a truly smart city where you're using the internet of things, algorithms, data processing, all sorts of technologies to create a safer, more integrated, cleaner, more vibrant town. Now, there's still work that needs to be done to make it truly just and to bring in the most isolated and the poorest communities. So I'm not in any way saying that it's perfection. But I think if you look at the literature on smart cities, these are cities that are trying to be very strategic about using new technologies in consultation with their populations to move out of that 20th century model altogether. Let's move into the 21st century. Let's leverage the power of these technologies and let's do it this time from the grassroots rather than just dictating from the top what the city is going to look like. And again, the environmental outcomes in Chattanooga, while they fall short of perfection, if you look at what they've accomplished in the last 30 years or so, it's very impressive. A great segue to the next question. Remind our audience, you can send us questions too through the, uh, the Q&A uh caption down there at the bottom just click on that send us questions um so you know professor fletcher you're, you're something of a, a, a i would say a technology futurist uh when you talk about things like de-extinction and in some ways you know the future is now as we think about the going from the pandemic to the endemic um, uh so we're in the stage now where um people are are and, and organizations are thinking about and there's some folks who pivoted uh, to working from home and they're still at home. And they're not likely to come back with or without uh, a new surge in, in, in the pandemic. I'm interested in, in, in both of your thoughts on whether um, the work, to the extent that the workplace is changing and how we think about where we do our work, our professional work, is that good for the environment going down the road or, or it might, won't make much of a difference things like a carbon footprint, for example, how does that change uh, the, dy the dynamics with respect to things like climate change, 
Um, and, and also, are there some equity issues to think about? Is it the case that there are going to be some winners and losers? The winners are people who can decide to work from home and actually have the uh, opportunity to do that, care of the job that they do or the organization they work for, versus other folks who just don't have that opportunity. They don't have a choice. They're frontline workers. And what does that mean in terms of equity and how do we address that? Is this a, basically an organizational issue or is it more of a societal challenge as we think about the future of the workplace? I'll jump in. I'm certainly not the expert that Amy is on this, but you know, I think the equity issues, especially if you're in a poor state like I am in Louisiana, and the frontline workers, you know, were getting sicker. Um, the communities of color um, in some of these environmental justice communities were the people that still had to go to work in the nursing homes and the restaurants and um, you know pick up the garbage and and it was. Um, you know, uh, the, the death rate, you know, is now trackable, you know, very clearly. Um, and, and it's, you know, to, to think of future pandemics and sort of a, a, a workforce that is so vulnerable and you add to it lack of decent health care and no, no good safety net for the insurance, um, you know, access to um, even healthy food, the food desert problem is um, a big one over in some of these environmental justice communities in Louisiana. But I think it, it is a um, societal problem because, you know, we, um, those of us with the luxury, you know, to teach our classes via, via Zoom for the last year and a half, or, um, you know, Zoom in on faculty meetings and just, um, you know, live our lives, you know, in, in yoga pants, you know, we, it, it is a different reality. And, uh, being back, you know, at, at this conference where I am this week now, uh, you know, every, people are joking going on, you know, the, the COVID weight gain, you know, the COVID-21, you know, or whatever that we're, you know, that we've all porked up a little bit, you know, with uh, staying at home. And, uh, you know, what a, what a um, stark contrast, you know, and, and, you know, some of my colleagues will catch themselves and realize that, uh, you know, this, this has taken such a, a huge toll uh, and, and for the little kids in their education and, you know, the numbers are coming in in Louisiana of, of the, um, you know, loss in uh, proficiency, you know, among fourth graders over the last year or two. And it's, you know, so I, I think it's a societal problem. And it, at a minimum, we um, in these poor, poor states like Louisiana are trying to do better to get uh, broadband band, uh, Wi-Fi services into some of these, especially rural uh, environmental justice communities in Louisiana. Um, and again, it, I, it, it, it's sobering you know, to think about the lack of uh, technical infrastructure in some of these communities. It makes, it makes communicating the science that much harder as well. Yeah. Well, to sort of put my, I guess, personal politics on the table, I am concerned. I have deep respect for agriculture, and I am one of those people who has been able to work remotely, and that's been quite lovely and freeing in certain ways. Sure. And I do agree, there's a real social justice problem here when the people who cannot work at home are also people who often have lower salaries. They don't have access to strong networks for things like childcare and more and more and more of these pressures fall on them while you also have this group of people who have so much more flexibility. How we solve that, I think that's one of the key, very difficult questions on the table. Related to that, my politics, I'm a fan of cities that work. You always have to have a rural agricultural sector in any society, but I'm very concerned that because of COVID momentum towards fixing urban areas now seems to be, let's just get out of the urban areas if we can as fast as possible. Because the data suggests that a vibrant urban area where people have amenities and schools and services within walking distance are actually better for the environment than everybody being spread out around lifestyle farms and the like. And again, I don't mean to criticize any individual's decision, but at a collective level, we really need functioning cities to deal to a lot of our habitat and environmental emissions problems. 
The other thing I would say, which is going a bit wide of your question, but it's basically relevant to what we're talking about. We also, while technologies are important, I just gave you the Chattanooga example, they're not a magic bullet. And if you look at something like Bitcoin, it makes the point. You hear a lot of hype around digital currencies and how great they'll be, and isn't this wonderful? Well, one Bitcoin server farm can take up as much annually emissions quota as the entire country of Norway. And there's de-accessioned nuclear power plants that have finally been managed to be taken offline that are having to come back online because utility companies need to meet this electricity demand. So when we look at the big picture, even though I tend to be a technology futurist and I look for a lot of solutions in technology, you also really have to back up and look at the full picture because digital technologies can be extremely environmentally, they can have quite an impact and they can consume a lot, a lot of electricity and create a lot of emissions. And so I think that's got to come into the mix as well. They're not a magic bullet by any stretch. Thank you. So in thinking about politics, um, in your experience, are there particular policies or management practices that both liberals and conservatives can get behind when it comes to the environment? I'll jump in quickly. I think, you know, in climate change, we've we've learned to look for those no regrets policies. And, and I think that, that that's kind of that sweet spot that we're looking for in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, for example, but energy efficiency, I think is mom and apple pie. And, and it's difficult to find too many people arguing with that other than, um, uh, again, in, in some of these industrial corridor uh, areas, the largest uh, consumers of the electricity and also the groundwater in, in my part of the world, uh, uh, for example, Exxon Mobil's big refinery <clears throat> north of Baton Rouge, that's <clears throat> the largest one in, that they have uh, anywhere in this country. But, but the idea of, again, even energy efficiency, it's, well, where do we start? You know, if it's uh, residential houses, I think everybody and his brother is on, on board with that. Um, some of the large uh, industries that form the tax base of some of, um, some of our cities and, and communities, um, you know, again, we'll often even say about energy efficiency that, that they're going to be incurring expense to get there and that that, um, you know, is, is not something they're, you know, stepping all over each other to be first in line to do. And but I think in general, energy efficiency is a no regrets type policy. Um, more specifically, you know, the, the stepping away from the carbon based economy. Um, you, you know, people's hair is on fire over here in Louisiana about what this might mean, you know, for Exxon and Mobil and, you know, the, bi the big oil and gas players. But the idea of transitioning into some kind of carbon sequestration services um, is something that, um, again, I think um, even, even the oil and gas industry people are getting a little bit excited about that there may be uh, a way to, to generate revenue and soften you know, the, the hard fall of this transition away from um, oil and gas intensive um, economy. Um, but again, that's not going to be without environmental uh, risk. You know, if we start thinking about, uh, you know, capturing carbon and putting it underground. Um, but again, I, I think, you know, so, as Amy was getting at also the smarter cities that are more livable, you know, areas where uh, we're not just stuck on interstates trying to get home from work every day. And, uh, you know, where, where things are just a little more livable and walkable. And um, uh, I think that is kind of a win-win, you know, that, that, that liberals and conservatives would, would agree, agree with. And finally, I think these, um, you know, sort of soft um, uh, strategies, soft uh, engineered strategies to, to deal with increasing flooding. Um, is something that at a <clears throat> at a local level benefits everyone, um, but again, it's a, it, the devil is in the detail. You know who has to give up something in the short term for that long term community gain that is going to occur sometime in the future. And when it gets here, it's going to be diffused and a little bit hard to assign a, a dollar value to. Uh, so who steps up today and incurs some extra expense? 
but I'm, I'm hopeful. I think there are some areas of the, these no regrets policies. I would agree with that. And one of the examples I use in my classes, because sometimes when you're eight, I mean, it can be anybody can start to feel despair. And I do sometimes worry about our 18 year old students because they're walking out into a very difficult world. And you don't want to just add to this sense of existential despair. <laughs> so when I need a good example that progress is possible, you can look at the US military on the issue of climate change. Now, if you frame it as, you know, a a protest issue, you know, you can frame it in certain ways that may not speak to that audience. But if you look at the Rand Corporation and some of the work they've been doing over the last 10 years on how climate change becomes a security issue, because it destabilizes already unstable countries of interest, it has an effect on terrorism, an effect on trafficking flows of people and animals and all sorts of things. So if you're willing to work in a context that speaks to that stakeholder, I think it does begin to transcend just partisan politics. And so the US military, I do have to point to, I think all up, it is now very serious and this isn't, it doesn't change from one administration to the other. I think there's a serious acceptance that climate change at the highest level is also a national security issue and that you need to be serious about that. Another example quickly that I could draw from would be New Zealand. They have one truly global world beating corporation in New Zealand and it's Fonterra and Fonterra is their dairy company. Mm. Well, they were very resistant at first, you know, climate, we don't <laughs> want to hear about it. It's all these things. But over time, Fonterra began to realize, well, maybe we don't compete on price. Maybe we do need to move from just dairy farming of a 20th century type. There are others that can do that at a cheaper price and better. What we need to do are value added products, you know, nutraceuticals and biopharma. And, you know, so again, it's all a process in motion. But I think what has to happen is that you have to learn how to speak to what the audience is concerned about. And if you can put it in that frame for them, I think people are quite willing to move. And I think it goes then beyond just simplistic blue, red, left, right, Republican, Democrat kind of divisions. Well, your timing is perfect because we're close to the top of the hour. Yeah. Boy, this is such a big uh, uh, issue area. And we could obviously spend many more hours talking about uh, the things that we've only just touched on today. We could have a whole course program. And in fact, that is that is uh, how the University of Georgia thinks about environmental issues. We have degree programs and uh, certificates and majors and minors uh, in, in multiple colleges and schools. So this was a pretty uh, ambitious uh, hour that we spent in, in really just taking a look. But I'm struck at the number of uh, moments where the issue of communication um, the issue of trust, uh, the notion that, well, you actually have to get different parties together to be successful. That really shines through in many of your remarks. And I also appreciate that, hey, environmental problems, uh, it, it, as, as you said, uh, Dr. Fletcher, it's not um, sure there are problems out there, but, but there are also some um, uh, real good il illustrations of ways to tackle those problems. And so uh, I, I appreciate that and want to leave on that, that help uh, um, there are many things to worry about in the world today. And of course, we have this conflict that's now taking place in, in uh, Ukraine. And there's some environmental issues that are cropping up uh, that people are discussing right now. Um, President Zelensky, uh, less than an hour ago, uh, reported that the uh, Russian forces are trying to seize the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So that, that's um, something to keep an eye on if you're interested in the environment moving forward. Um, uh, so with that, um, I'm going to let folks uh, move on with their, with their day. And I want to thank both of you for joining us. This has been a great session. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Matt. Thank you, Amy. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.